We are constantly exposed to information about food, diet and nutrition from magazines, newspapers, books, food labels, advertisements, news broadcasts, TV shows, not only from registered dietitians but from all sorts of health professionals that may have minimal knowledge of food and nutrition, as well as chefs, fitness instructors, gurus of all kinds and other unspecified experts. It's easy to accept an idea because we like it, because it's nice, because it sounds right, it makes sense or we wish it was true, because we trust the person who supports it or because it worked for someone else. But none of the above reasons belong to the realm of science. Science is based on solid evidence and a specific method which is used to generate and evaluate that evidence. It's the only objective tool we have to tell what's true from what isn't, what is just a brilliant idea from what is actually proven by the facts, what makes sense from what actually is, what we wish it was true from what is true indeed. It would be wrong to think that science should only be made with evidence and measurable facts. With that alone, science does not advance. The beauty of science is that we are allowed to freely use our intuition and imagination to try to explain the facts we observe, even when that means formulating the most absurd and provocative hypotheses and designing the most revolutionary theories. But what we are not allowed to do is to confuse speculations with facts. If an author wants to write a diet book, say the purple cucumber diet, and explain why he thinks this is the best solution to lose weight and forever be healthy, he has every right to do it. But what he cannot do is selling what's nothing more than his own ideas as if they were proven facts or universally accepted truths. Unfortunately, many popular diet books do just that. So before we even start discussing food and nutrition, I want to give you a couple of tools to be able to be more objective when you're faced with new information concerning diet, food and nutrition. The very first thing we need to understand is the difference between anecdotal evidence and controlled experiments. In most popular diet books, you'll find case reports that may sound more or less like this. There it was, Mr. So-and-so, sick and wasting away, his doctors had already given up on him, and there I came, I had him follow my purple cucumber diet, and lo and behold, before a couple of months, all of his symptoms has disappeared, his doctors were bewildered, his body weight was normal, his blood tests were perfect, he had never felt so well and energized his whole life, and he was happily running in the sunshine. Well, this is what we call an anecdotal case, that is, the story of one specific episode. Even accepting the truthfulness of the story, in science this has no demonstrative value whatsoever because there's nothing to indicate that it's not just a coincidence. Maybe the unexpected recovery of Mr. So-and-so was indeed due to the purple cucumber diet, but maybe it has nothing to do with it, and it got better for completely different reasons. Maybe he would have improved even without the diet. Imagine you have a cold and I tell you to wear a red t-shirt. The following day you are feeling better and I come and say, see, I was right that wearing red makes the cold go away. You would likely answer, what are you talking about? It has nothing to do with it. My cold resolved by itself because I stayed in bed. The fact that I was wearing a red t-shirt was just a coincidence. And you would be right, of course, but then again, who knows? Maybe it was the red t-shirt. Maybe it was the purple cucumber diet that made Mr. So-and-so get better. How can we find out? The tool that scientists have to answer this question is a controlled experiment. We could select 20 patients just like Mr. So-and-so and then randomly assign half of them to follow the purple cucumber diet and the other half to follow a regular diet everything else being the same. If patients on the purple cucumber diet group get better significantly more or significantly faster than patients following the regular diet, then we can say that there is an association between the purple cucumber diet and the patient's recovery. But bear with me one more minute. The fact that we have now proven the existence of an association still does not imply that there is a cause-effect link. For example, did you know that ice cream sales are associated with jellyfish bites in coastal areas? Indeed, it has been shown that on those summer days in which ice cream sales are higher, jellyfish bites increase. Does that mean that eating ice cream somehow attracts jellyfish? 
Maybe, but it is much more likely that there is no direct link between these two events, and instead they are both consequence of another variable, heat. In hotter days, people buy more ice creams to alleviate the heat, and for the same reason, they also take more baths or spend more time in the ocean. Because they bathe more, the odds of being bitten by a jellyfish are increased. The fact that the two events occur together does not imply that one causes the other. In Greece, researchers observed that there is a very high consumption of olive oil and a very low incidence of cardiovascular disease. Does this prove that olive oil prevents cardiovascular disease? Not necessarily. Maybe they use a lot of olive oil because they have a lot of olives, because there is a lot of sun. And because there is a lot of sun, they make a lot of vitamin D in their skin, which protects them from cardiovascular disease. So always remember, association does not imply causation. Designing controlled experiments is not always possible, especially when we want to evaluate the effect of whole dietary pattern over the long term, because they would be prohibitively long, expensive, and require an incredibly large number of study subjects. In these cases, scientists rely on epidemiological evidence, that is, studying the outcomes of a large number of real-life cases and controls, chosen with appropriate and objective criteria in large enough number that the outcomes can be of statistical significance. The big problem here is of a different kind, and it's what we call confounding factors. Suppose we want to see if a vegan diet carries a lower risk for heart disease. Well, you may think, that's easy. Let's just find a bunch of vegans, say 1,000, and then 1,000 meat eaters, and let's just record their rate of heart disease over time and compare them to see if it's lower in vegans. Well, if we do it like that, chances are that indeed we will find out that vegans have lower rates of heart disease. But is it because they don't eat meat? Most people who go on a vegan diet are health-saving in the first place. They are more careful at designing a healthful, balanced diet in general. On top of that, they likely don't smoke, they don't drink alcohol, and they are on average more physically active. No wonder that they suffer less of heart disease. But if we want to tease out specifically the contribution of the vegan diet in itself, we will have to adjust for all the confounding factors. That is, everything else being equal, same level of physical activity, same use of alcohol or tobacco and so on, do vegans still have less heart disease than meat eaters? As you can imagine, doing such an investigation is extremely difficult. If you're curious about the answer to this specific question, in light of the evidence we have, it turns out that if meat eaters also eat enough fiber, fruit and vegetables, their risk for heart disease is about the same as vegans. But what's important to remember now is that just one or a few studies are never enough to make a final conclusion about the reality of things. The universally accepted nutritional guidelines that we will study in this course are never based on just a bunch of studies, but on a large body of numerous, consistent and replicable evidence that have been generated at many different levels. Mechanistic level, cellular level, biochemical level, chemical level, epidemiological level, clinical level, in a way that everything fits and points to the same conclusion, convincingly supporting a theory to the point that we are confident to make practical recommendation to the population. Unfortunately, many popular diet books and gurus don't follow the same rigorous standards and make recommendations or worse based entire theories on just one or two scientific studies, and sometimes not even that. References The devil can cite scriptures for its purposes, the saying goes. And this is true with scientific studies published in peer-reviewed literature too. Making a statement and referencing a scientific study always creates a sort of authoritative aura. But if you handpick and magnify those studies that support your ideas and ignore those that are against, all you are doing is distorting reality. If you conveniently select the parts of those studies that you like, or report their findings in an inflated way, you are not being objective. If of the studies whose conclusion you find convenient, you focus on the outcomes, and of those that go against, you focus on flaws, limitations, or conflicts of interests, you are not being honest. Every study has limitations. Simply referring to scientific studies is not enough to make conclusions. Take these two books. 
they propose eating models that are diametrically opposite. One advocates for a totally plant-based diet, the other recommends meat for breakfast. And yet both are not only interesting and very well-written readings, they are both based on solid evidence and written by respected and honest scientists. How is that possible? The thing is, the right way to use the scientific evidence is asking a question and then look for all the available evidence. And if it lacks, design new experiments. This way you will find evidence pro and evidence against, and you can weigh the evidence. The wrong way of using the scientific evidence, on the other hand, is starting with a preset mind and your made-up conclusions, and then look for the evidence to support it. Chances are that in the hundreds of thousands of studies that have been performed in the history of science, you will always find something that agrees with your ideas. But if you focus on that alone and ignore everything else, all you're doing is a disservice to science. Mass media and social media often report such oversimplified versions of the information to the point that it becomes distorted. One thing is doing an experiment and finding that a molecule in red meat may create a toxic compounds in your intestine. A much different thing is tweeting, researchers finally prove that red meat can kill you. If you read a scientific paper, you'll find plenty of may, this suggests, we hypothesize, it could potentially result in, and then the limitations of this study are, more research is needed to confirm, and so on. These gray zones usually get lost when the news trickles down to the media's blogs and social networks. And because of that, it is very common to be faced with apparently conflicting information, which only confuse and frustrate the consumer. Scientists discover that chocolate prevents cancer. You may read one day. The following month, you may read another headline that says, a team of researchers from the University of Southern California detected the toxic compounds in chocolate. What does that mean? Is chocolate bad or good? Which one of them is lying? How can chocolate be cancer one day and be toxic the other day? Very likely, what study number one really found was that chocolate consumption lowered blood concentrations of a pro-inflammatory molecule. While this has the potential of being a cancer-preventive outcome, it certainly doesn't mean that eating chocolate in itself can prevent cancer. Study number two may have found a few micrograms of a compound which, when present at much, much higher concentration, is toxic. But this does not mean that the levels detected in chocolate posed any practical risk for health. Both findings were honest. It's the headline conclusions that were oversimplified and dramatized, thus failing to put the information in the right perspective. But who really bothers to go back and check the original source after reading this kind of news? Most people don't even get past the headline to read the whole article. A retweet may be all they get about the story. But reality is always more complex than 140 characters. Risk assessment. Imagine you see a guy walking down the street wearing a helmet. Why are you wearing a helmet? You ask him. For fear that something may fall from the sky and hit me on the head, he replies. You will probably think that taking this protective measure is an overkill. It is indeed possible that a random falling object may hit him, but it is so unlikely that it doesn't make much sense to worry about it. But now imagine that after a few seconds you see the same guy crossing a busy street on a red light without even bothering to watch left and right. Now you would certainly think that something must be wrong with the guy. He is totally not getting the priorities. Well, when it comes to food, many of us behave just like this guy. We are overly concerned with issues that are far less pressing than is generally thought such as the potential toxicity of food additives, food contaminants, or naturally occurring substances, residues of pesticides, antibiotics, and other agrochemicals, or packaging migrations. And while our perceived risk of minor problems is exaggerated, the risk of other much more impacting issues concerning eating behavior in general, such as eating too much salt or not enough fruit and vegetables, is often underestimated. An important tool to objectively assess the impact of a potential danger is part of the risk analysis process. In particular, when we consider a danger, we must take into account its severity as well as its probability. Take the danger of an airplane crash, for example. Its severity would be very high, 
but its probability is so low that we consider air travel to be reasonably safe. The same line of reasoning applies to the potential toxicity of, say, artificial sweeteners, alkaloids in herbs and spices, or residues of pesticides. In countries like the US or the European Union, we have legislation and agencies that worry about these issues, so we don't have to. They perform risk analysis assessments for naturally occurring toxins or contaminants. They regulate and monitor the acceptable levels of residues, what additives can be used in each food and in what amount, and so on, so that the levels of all these substances are reasonably safe for consumers. As Paracelsus said, all things can be poisons, depending on the dose. Even water can kill you if you drink 20 liters in a row. The fact that a particular food color may be dangerous at much higher doses than what you can possibly get even if you eat a variety of food containing it doesn't mean that these additives pose any reasonable threat at the doses it's found in food. For some other substances, like some preservatives, it's considered that the benefit of using them far outweighs the risk. Similarly, the benefit of eating an apple with all its skin far outweighs the risk of its negligible amounts of pesticide residues. Every day we are exposed to thousands of substances that are potentially toxic in the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the clothes we wear, the products we use to wash our body, our house and our clothes, and so on. The fact that some of these substances may cause an allergic reaction or contribute to initiate cancer in 1 in 50 million people does not justify worrying more than we should worry about being struck by a thunder or being victims of an airplane crash. If you still have to learn how to balance your lipids, control glycemic load, choose whole grain products over refined ones, eat legumes, limit meat consumption, avoid excess salt, optimize fruit and vegetable consumption, and all those things that constitute the basis of a health-promoting and disease-preventing diet, it does not make any sense to worry about bisphenol A in plastic bottles, or the toxicity of food preservatives, or the effect of microwave radiations on food nutrients. These are not the priorities, because excess salt, saturated and trans fats, insulin peaks, and lack of antioxidants will have already killed you long before pesticide residues have started to even damage you. In conclusion, when you come across new information concerning food and nutrition, I strongly encourage you to always put everything in perspective. Who says this? How can he say it? What's the evidence supporting it? How was it generated? Is it just an anecdotal case, an epidemiological study, or a controlled intervention trial? How much evidence backs up this idea? Is it just one study or many? What is the real impact of this finding? Don't trust those who preach from high, who tell you what you should and shouldn't do without explaining you why and giving you supporting evidence. Nutrition is a science. It cannot be based on what sounds reasonable, what we wish was true, or what gurus or so-called experts say. It cannot be based on faith, but only on solid, convincing, and repeated evidence. I will leave you today with the words that Carl Sagan used to describe Johannes Kepler, who spent a large part of his life trying to prove something that eventually turned out to be wrong. When he found that his long-cherished beliefs did not agree with the most precise observations, he accepted the uncomfortable facts. He preferred the hard truth to his dearest illusions. That is the heart of science.